Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Palm Springs Art Museum's virtual program tonight. We're so pleased that you've joined us, and I would like to welcome you to our program, Gerald Clark Falling Rock, which is a um, gallery tour, discussion, and book launch um, for our new publication um, related to Gerald Clark's exhibition. In a moment, I'm going to introduce all of our participants, but first I would like to um, thank everybody for being here and give a little bit of um, background. Um, we are very happy to be continuing our virtual public program series, which began in December. And uh, as you can tell for each of the events, I'm moving around the museum. We're sorry that you're not able to be in the building with us yet. We hope to be um, able to reopen in the spring. But in the meantime, we are broadcasting here from the museum. And I am in the Clay's Wing, uh, just in front of Gerald Clark's exhibition, which we will look at shortly. Um, in the meantime, I am here with Gerald Clark, um, artist and um, a fantastic uh, participant in our museum and now a board member. Um, I am here with Ashley Holland, um, scholar and curator um, from Art Bridges Foundation in Arkansas. And I am also here with Palm Springs Art Museum curator, Christine Giles. I will give a little bit more of an introduction to each of them in a moment and their full bios are on our website. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to thank some of the people behind the scenes. We have a fantastic team here at the Palm Springs Art Museum. I would also like to thank Louis Grouchus, the Joanne McGrath Executive Director and CEO, and all of our trustees. Funding for this public program has been made possible in part by the Coita and Donald Barker Foundation. A version of this talk with closed captioning will be available on YouTube in the following week uh, after this event by clicking the closed captioning or CC button on your screen on YouTube. And before we start this program, I wanted to let you know that the next one will be on February 25th at 5 p.m. It is a program featuring our current glass exhibition curated by Catherine Huff, and she will be in conversation with artist Richard Whitley, whose work is in our collection and also on view. We are very pleased to be bringing you that. We're sorry you haven't been able to see this exhibition yet, but we will be showing it to you virtually until you can come into the building. So for this evening's program, first we're going to have a virtual tour of the exhibition that is just behind me. Then Christine Giles is gonna share some insights about this particular work featured continuum basket, which is here, um, as well as some of the historic um, aspects of collecting um, Kauia baskets um, and some of the iconography. Then we will hear from Ashley Holland, who is a contributing scholar um, to the exhibition catalog about Gerald's relationship to language in his work. And then Gerald will present some of the works from the exhibition in detail. Um, after this, we're going to have a conversation about various topics, including place and locality, practices of collecting Native American work at art museums, impacts of colonialism on museum spaces and more. It promises to be quite an interesting evening with lots of important and relevant topics. And we will of course open up to you um, for your questions. And now a little bit more of um, introduction before we turn it over to the exhibition itself. Gerald Clark is a contemporary Kauia artist who lives and works in Anza, California. We're so happy to be here in his region. He's an enrolled member of the Kauia Band of Indians and has served as vice chairman on the Kauia Tribe, Ca Tribal Council and as the Southern California representative to the California Association of Tribal Governments. He received an MA and an MFA in studio arts with an emphasis on painting and sculpture uh, from Stephen F. Austin State University in Texas. Um, Clark, uh, Gerald Clark is an associate professor at California, uh, University of California Riverside in the Department of Ethnic Studies. Ashley Holland is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and she is a scholar and curator and currently serves as curator at Art Bridges Foundation in Bentonville, Arkansas. Arkansas. 
She's a former assistant curator of Native, Native American art at the Idle Jordan Museum of American Indians and Western art in Indianapolis, one of the lenders to the exhibition, um, where she worked from 2007 to 2016. And she's also a doctoral candidate in art history at the University of Oklahoma. And Christine Giles is senior curator at the Palm Springs Art Museum, where she has worked since 1996. She knows our collection backwards and forwards. And in addition to overseeing many aspects of the Native American collection, which has re recently been reinstalled, she also has a great knowledge for our Stephen H. Willard photography collection and archive, um, which is vast. Um, she has curated many exhibitions, over 30 of them, including the exhibition Journey Through the Desert, The Road Less Traveled in 2018. Again, all of their bios are on our website. And I'm Rochelle Steiner. I'm Chief Curator and Director of Public Programs and Education here at the Palm Springs Art Museum. So without further ado, I would like to um, invite you on a virtual tour of the exhibition with Gerald. We're going to show you some pictures. And as we're doing that, and as the pictures are coming up, I'm going to ask Gerald first to tell us about the title of the exhibition, which is Falling Rock. And I know this is an important aspect of the show. So Gerald, as we start here at the entry, can you tell us please about Falling Rock? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And thank you for all of you who are tuning in uh, tonight. Uh, you know, the, the Falling Rock story uh, comes from my childhood and my parents divorced pretty early and my mom moved us down into Orange County. So my, my dad was good about coming and picking me up and bringing me back to the reservation. And we would drive up these highways through the mountains and I kept seeing these falling rock signs and I'm like six, seven years old, you know? And so I didn't understand what that meant. So I asked my dad, what, what, what's the falling rock? And he told me that was the name of the last wild Indian who never gave up. And so since then, I've always remembered that. And years later, I asked my dad about it. He didn't even remember saying that. <laughs> and yet, you know, in my mind, it, it just solidified, you know, and became part of my identity. So, I, you know, I've named my website Falling Rock. And, you know, it's just like in, in that spirit of never giving up. And according to my dad, those signs were everywhere where he was uh, spotted uh, attacking passing cars or what have you. So it's that spirit that I kind of go into the studio with when I'm making my work. And that's where that comes from. Thank you so much, Gerald, for telling us about that. Um, it is um, something that we uh, have brought with us to this idea of the show. And we're gonna enter the exhibition with the next slide and take people through the exhibition. And um, we'd love for you to tell us a little bit about it. So um, we're just gonna move through the spaces virtually on the screen. So um, next slide, please. Well, you know, the, the centerpiece right there is the, you know, as you enter the exhibition is the uh, continuum basket. And I believe Christine's gonna talk about that a bit more, but as you come into the exhibition, you'll see to the left there, you see a painting and a sculpture, both uh, representing the yucca plant, which uh, in our Kwea language panel uh, is an important plant for food, but also fibers. And so I, I pay homage to our history and our traditional culture uh, the sculpture is about 10 and a half feet tall and it's out of steel and aluminum and is powder coated. And that's the newest work in the, in the museum. Uh, and then the painting there, uh, which was inspired by uh, images of uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe is the central image of the yucca with this halo of uh, bird singing rattles, which is something I participate in. Uh, and it was just like, a, a, like I said, an inspiration for that. But, you know, um, I, both those artworks I see as, as kind of social political because, you know, I'm asserting tribal sovereignty when I'm expressing our traditions. And maybe uh, the average viewer doesn't get that, but uh, that's, that was why I made those pieces. Next slide, please. And so here we are uh, like further into the gallery and you can see, and, and I think for those of you who haven't seen the show yet, you might think this is a group show. <laughs> I tend to work in a variety of materials and forms. So there you see the large yucca sculpture. And then uh, there on the pedestal is, is a small bronze similar to the larger one. And then there's the painting on the far wall. And then to the left is a, an installation, a sculptural installation with large uh, printed uh, digital images. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, you'll be able to see 
the digital images better along with the, the installation. And this was all part of my one tracked mind series. And this was uh, in response to the housing crisis that we saw back in 2007. And the, uh, you know, uh, we, we saw here, particularly in California, we saw a lot of foreclosures and things. And so, you know, I, I was thinking about that. And I was thinking, you know, if anyone knows what it's like to lose a home, to lose a, a homeland, it's Indian people. And so I started thinking about that. And I wanted to say something about that. So that central installation, the little houses you see there that I, you know, my, my daughters uh, uh, thought it was when we were making, it was kind of like a, a Wallace and Gromit kind of miniature world that we were making. And that was actually based on an actual uh, um, neighborhood of, off of Google Earth uh, in Temecula, California. But underneath the houses, there's little grass, um, you know, AstroTurf squares. And then underneath that are uh, screen images of artifacts and, and tribal art that's buried underneath those houses. And so I, I, I've been thinking a lot about progress. I've been thinking a lot about these development, particularly here in California. And, you know, uh, uh, Native history in California is California history. It is American history. And a lot of it's getting bulldozed and, and, and buried under these settlements. And that led us to this housing crisis, right? And so, you know, the images there are all actual images that I that I took, photographs I took, and then altered, added different things. So the two digital images you see there on the left, those houses are on top of a row of basketry. And then the houses in the, the, the next uh, image there, uh, underneath it is the Kiksaval, which is the, the Jimson flower, which is one of our sacred uh, plants. So that the layering, right, of the, the image of the house is on top of uh, the, 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 the art, the, the flora. That was all part of, of that, um, you know, what I was thinking about at that time. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, and so uh, uh, one of the older uh, paintings in the show is the, the image that you see there on the right. And um, uh, I actually, that was at the very end of my graduate uh, career. That was part of my MFA thesis show. And upon graduating, I actually donated this painting to the tribe. And it, it's hung for years in our tribal hall and uh, our, our, our community building where we have uh, governmental meetings, community meetings, community dinners. Uh, and so, you know, I, I wanted to bring it back home in that old void shape that you see repeated through there. It was inspired by these uh, dance batons that were used by the Kawea in the uh, Eagle Dance. And I'd seen an image in a book by an anthropologist about the Kawea. And I, I just fell in love with that form. And so just creating this kind of mystical screen or atmosphere with those forms. Uh, it is what I was attempting to do. And then the, the, the case that you see there on the left, there's a, there's a basket, right? And there's a couple of historic rattles. And then there's a rattle that I made. And so, uh, you know, the, the can basket that we started the, the slideshow with, uh, it's called a continuum basket. That's the, the, how I see them. And just in that one case right there, I see a continuum. And so I don't, I don't, think in terms of past or present or future. It's, it's all just a, like a, a, a flow, right? A, a rhythm that, that I'm a part of and I go with. And, and so, you know, I, 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 I'm not looking backward. Um, I'm, I'm not stuck in the present and I'm not, you know, wishing for a future. I'm just like part of this moment in time. Uh, let's move forward. So here's a, a you know a, 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 the yucca painting that I, I uh, mentioned earlier uh, had the bird singing rattles and you know that type of singing was was at risk of becoming extinct in the, in the late 80s and luckily there were some tribal young men who wrote a grant and they relearned the songs from elders they were paired up with elders and then more and more people got involved. And now we're having uh, bird singing events here in the, the Cuya area and, you know, Southern California, uh, Western Arizona, Southern uh, Nevada, and it's, it's kind of been a renaissance. And, you know, one of the things I often talk about as an artist isn't self-expression, but it's the responsibility of the artist. And so, you know, within my community, I saw this rebirth of this tradition. And I, you know, as an artist, I felt like if I'm gonna call myself a Kauia artist, 
I need to, to document this renaissance and be a part of it. And so the painting there, I, I always called that or referred to it as my blanket painting. And that, there's a zigzag pattern in the background. And so I just painted these uh, individual bird song rattles. I'm often interested in, in how different singers decorate their rattles. It's, it's a personal form of, of art and expression. And then I, I glued uh, four DVDs, blank DVDs to the corners because I never want anyone to, to find my work and wonder if it was made in 1860 or 1910. You know, I'm very much of, of the end of the 20th century into the 21st century. And so I, I do things like that. And then the gourd sculpture there is, is oversized and there's a speaker in, and, and the speaker plays the sounds of bird songs. It plays the sounds of me and my dad watching the NBA finals and sitting around just talking and it's like the, the, the queer sounds right our lives the sounds of our lives because that's what bird singing is to me it's the sounds of the people uh next slide uh so lately uh for those of you who who know a bit about my background uh, i help run my family's cattle ranch here on the reservation and and uh, the the indians here in california were some of the first cowboys in california and so i've i've found my best work seems to come from when uh, I take things from my real life, my everyday experience, and then I bring them into the art practice. So I started making cattle brands, you know, I, I've made cattle brands for our cows, but then I started making them as sculptures. And so here you see the assortment of, of the brands. And if we go to the next image, uh, here's an example of one of those uh, brand prints. And so I call them prints. I don't know if that's uh, correct or not, but you know, I, I, I soak watercolor paper and then I heat up these individual brands. So what you're seeing here, the print you're seeing here is two different brands. And so I heat them up. Sometimes they're too hot and the paper just immediately bursts into flames. Sometimes it's not hot enough and I don't get a good image. And so, it's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sit down for a couple hours and I'll crank out 30 or 40 of them. And then I choose the one that I like the best. And that's the one I end up framing. And so, you know, these are social, political kind of messages, I think. You know, um, there's a lot going on, right, about immigration and who belongs in this country. And, and I, I thought it was important as a Native person to speak about this. And if we go to the next slide, um, you know, all my Native friends, you know, on on Facebook or what have you, we're, we're all kind of confused about this whole idea of who belongs. And so there's an image of me actually making the, the brand. And so, you know, the, the word native, the word amnesia. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, and th th these are kind of fun to make, they're exciting. There's, there I am uh, heating up the brands with the, the torch. And again, it's, it's uh, they're really, really hot. So lining the paper up, lining up the different uh, brands or whatever, it, it's all just real intuitive. It has to be done fairly quickly. And so I, I end up making a lot of them and then choosing the ones I like. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is going back a, a few years. I believe this was from 2002. And so in the foreground there, I, I just got to thinking about, I wanted to do a painting like a, a, like the, a game board. And so I worked very hard. And if you get a chance to see the show, uh, the game board itself looks to be like machine made or printed. And I worked very hard to make it appear that way, but it's actually mostly hand done. Even the, the vinyl lettering I placed by hand, you know, and, and then covered it with, with uh, a resin. But, uh, and I hung it on the wall as a painting. And then eventually I was like, well, you know what? It'd be cool if people could play that. So I, then I made rules, I made cards to go with it. And actually you could sit down and play uh, this, uh, this game. And some of the, the, uh, the, the, the cards are quite racist actually. And I, I find myself sometimes making my, my own artwork and I find it kind of somewhat offensive, you know? And, but you have to go there, I think, as an artist. You have to go there and delve into those other things. And, you know, I try not to make judgments and I try not to make people think a certain way. I just pose these things and, and I, I want the viewer to kind of come to some kind of understanding of, of maybe what I'm trying to do and, and point them in a direction. Okay, next slide. Uh, so this was uh, this piece was a direct uh, uh, kind of reaction to uh, my daughter Emily and I. We we went up to Standing Rock to the protest, uh, uh, the No Dapple protest, and um, you know it was it was quite an experience. And so I wanted to make something 
related to that experience. So I created this kind of faux um, uh, pipeline that cuts through the wall or the corner of the gallery. And um, then, you know, when we were there, we saw all ki kinds of law enforcement. I've never felt that kind of oppression in this country before. And so, you know, the other thing too is, you know, uh, Americans today, we, we love pop culture and we love these movie series. And so I got these stormtrooper dolls off the internet and then I dress them up as the, the, the law enforcement that I saw. And, you know, these movies are kind of dumbed down to the point where the good people are always good and the bad people are always bad. And we all know life's not really like that, but I dress them up to, to kind of draw people in and kind of make people think about, well, who's the good guy here in this, uh, in this situation? And then the, the messiness of the cords at the bottom, it's no accident that those cords are black. I, that, that's oil. That's oil leaking out of those pipes for me, but they're actually audio cords. So the leaks, the title is leaks. You, you put the headphones on and you can actually hear stories of people who are there and who witnessed what was happening there. And so it's like the storytelling is leaks, right? That's, that's what's going to be remembered from that. And um, yeah, that's, that was a, a fun piece to do. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's political and such, but again, I want to, I want to pose the question and allow the viewer to kind of work their way through the issue. Next slide. Okay, so this is to uh, uh, part of what I call the monument series. And I wanna point out that one of the things I like to do, and you know, we think of artists as being creative, right? And so one of the things that I you know, really wanted to do was to, uh, you know, I like to get found objects, already made objects, and then work them into a sculpture. So this three-tiered kind of sculpture, you see the Greek columns at the bottom, and then there, those are beer bottles in the center as columns, and then these large hands. And I bought these large hands, and they were supposed to be like a, a place to sit a, a doll or something, and then I bought that exit sign. And it was just my idea of thinking about those previous generations that have gone on, um, you know, before me, and and this idea of, of an afterlife and heaven and, and paying homage to those people. You know, uh, you know we take our, our elders, you know, we, 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 we prize our elders and, you know, a, a lot of my heroes are no longer here with me today, you know, and so this is kind of a monument to them. Moving forward. Yeah, next slide. So I just want to stop here for one. Okay. So, Joe, you want to say something about this institution? Because sure. I know it's it's not just here on our site, but also um, around the city. Yeah, so these are my road signs series. And, you know, uh, I've been doing these road signs since around 2001 or so. And these are copies of the originals that I I installed six of them around the reservation here. And there again is that idea of responsibility um, how can I call myself a Kahlua artist if my own community never gets to see my work? And so I installed these signs uh, with our, our language on them around the reservation. And, you know, I, I don't think anybody saw it as art. They just kind of thought it was pretty cool and, and such. And, and that's enough for me, actually, you know. And uh, uh, eventually they were all destroyed with a shotgun. And, uh, you know, that's the natural life of, an, of a sign on the res. And, you know, it's kind of the final, what I call reservation art criticism. <laughs> but uh, we installed these uh, copies in the parking lot there of the, the museum. And then I worked with the Palm Springs Art Commission and we installed 13 um, other types of signs using the Kahlua language uh, in some of the city parks there uh, in Palm Springs. And I, I, I wanna point out too, that the signs in the, in the parks that we did, I went to the Agua Caliente and I asked their cultural people for their uh, spellings and their pronunciations, because just because I'm queer doesn't give me a right to come into Agua Caliente's land and do my thing, right? So that respect for, for place, I think, is, is just kind of ingrained in me. And so um, I know you can get a, a, a map that'll take you to, to visit some of those other signs. Yes, and so thank you for that, Gerald. And I wanted to mention that though the museum is closed, these road signs are installed in our north parking lot. And on our website, there is a, a map 
to where the um, pieces are around the city. So if you want to go and visit them on a bike ride or um, a tour, um, they are in the various different parks. So that is something that you can experience um, uh, right now outside um, until the museum reopens. Um, thank you, Gerald, so much for taking us on that little tour of the exhibition inside and outside. And it's a perfect segue because one of the things about these road signs is that you have utilized language, um, which is so um, prevalent in your work. Uh, we will turn to language in a moment, but first, before we do that, um, I would like to ask Christine Giles to talk about the continuum basket, which is in the next image. Um, and in some ways, the continuum basket is where some of this discussion about this exhibition started um, for the museum. This was a commission, um, and this work is actually in our permanent collection. So while you see it here on the entry wall to the exhibition, I know many of you have seen it in other locations in the museum previously because it is one of our permanent pieces. So Christine, um, thank you for talking about this work. Thank you, Rochelle. And Gerald, thank you so much for the introduction to the exhibition. That was quite nice. And I think what people can um, gain from that is how in Gerald's work, um, how he's equally influenced by his ancestral heritage and being Kuiya as he is by his training as a contemporary artist. And this is a perfect example um, of how that bridge is made. It's called, um, even the title using the word continuum that in the title in the series, Continuum Basket Pavat um, illustrates that connection. Um, Pavat is uh, the Kuiya word for tobacco. And so that's the name of this piece. Um, I wanted to give you a little background. I think the background and the development of this, um, uh, Rochelle already mentioned it was a commission. And so um, I, Gerald and I began discussing the design for this work. Oh, it was, Gerald, I'm, I hate to say it was almost four years ago. Um, it was in the late summer, fall of 2017. And, and then he completed the work in 2018. But the goal of the commission was to have Gerald create an artwork that could be the main feature of this exhibition. And you saw that, and you can see it behind Rochelle right now, and you saw it in the beginning slide of how it was uh, the feature for the exhibition. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background. Um, um, our work, um, Continuum Basket Pivot, is the third Continuum Basket that he's made. I wanted to show you the two other works. Continuum Basket Flora is on the left. It's from 2016. And that's in the Entree Museum of the American West in Los Angeles. And on the right is his very first Continuum Basket. And it's just called Continuum Basket. It's from 2002, 2002. And both of these are about five feet in diameter. In addition to featuring um, the work that we commissioned in the exhibition, there were two other cr criteria that we desired for the work. First, I wanted a large scale work, one that would have the presence in the gallery. Um, and then after the exhibition's over, that would also have presence when it's shown with other contemporary um, artworks in our collection. So that was one criteria. We wanted something larger. And the second, I wanted this to connect to the museum and to this site and to the Kui land where the museum is situated. So I talked to Gerald about look, looking at our historic basket collection and to help base that work on some, some of the works um, that we have in that collection. So next slide, please. So here are the two baskets after um, he viewed several um, baskets that we have in our collection and, and settled on these two um, for that design. Both of these date from the early um, first quarter of the 20th century. And on the left is Donna Tortes. Uh, she's from the Santa Rosa Indian Reservation. Um, this is a tray and you'll see what the black uh, triangular elements are, are representing bats. 
And on the work on the right, um, Nicolasa Potencio, this is a tray. And in the center, you see that floral tobacco design. And, and both of these elements then end up being incorporated into the final. So I'll show you the final again, just so you can make a, a relationship between those two. So next slide, please. So here you can see how, how he integrated those into the overall um, design. But I um, wanted to let you know um, in the final, um, there's 1,884 crushed aluminum beer and soda cans that go in to make up this piece and they're all mounted on a satellite dish. So um, Gerald was willing to go very large, but we settled on uh, about nine feet, I think was your first suggestion, Gerald, but we settled on seven and a half feet diameter. So it's a good scale, it's a good scale work. Um, and it, it has an overall nocturnal theme and what you, because tobacco flowers bloom at night. And then of course, bats are nocturnal. And then on the outer edge, you can see some dark blue triangular elements. And Gerald had indicated that re represented the night sky. So it, this is a really interesting work. We, we did have it in the gallery for a, almost a year before the exhibition began. So I had an opportunity to watch people observe this, both children and adults, and it is, it's a very attractive piece. And from a distance, you really pick up that kind of reflection in, and also almost like beadwork. And so it's kind of reflective of that. But when, um, when you get up close, it has um, a little bit different um, message. But, one thing I wanted to mention is um, not just um, that scale and design, but as in with most of Gerald's work, there's usually a, an under, underlying message. And in this case, it was in the choice of beer and soda cans. And that was to address the disproportionate high rates of alcoholism and diabetes in Native American communities. So, and the next is a detail. So uh, if you'll go to the next slide, thank you. I just thought it'd be good for you to see the various elements. When you get closer, you can, you can tell, you know, that these are crushed cans. And that was really what the audience would do. From a distance, it was beauty and shiny. And then you get up close and that they, there was almost an awe, um, but also an intrigue that they, it was made with uh, recycled cans. And the children especially were excited about this work. So it's, a, it's very popular. Um, you'll also see on this how he starts in the center. He creates this design also. He, he, would, he did a chalk drawing on the, um, the satellite dish, but when he goes into lay um, the actual cans, you can see he follows the same circular pattern that basket weavers do from the center and then working to the outer edge. Um, let's see. So I um, wanted to ask Gerald, um, or, or he, Gerald was asked, to, he told a story about how he came up with that first concept of the continuum basket in, in 2002. And I asked him if it was fine if I could relay this story and he was fine with that. Um, Gerald's very open about his father's alcoholism. And in, in, 20, um, in 2002, he was, still living in Oklahoma, and but he would regularly would come out for visits. Uh, his father um, had had several DUIs, and on one of those charges, he was assigned community service in a junkyard. Well, his father enjoyed collecting junk, and so um, I don't think that was too much of a punishment for him, but he brought home a satellite dish, and this, but this ended up laying around in the yard, and I, I don't think it ever functioned as a satellite dish. And then also in the yard, he there was a container in which they would collect to recycle um, beer cans and soda cans. And I'm really sharing this story also not for the under, also one for the underlying message, but also it gives you an insight in, into how Gerald quickly makes these associations. Um, so he took those two elements that he um, viewed on um, on the ranch on his father's home, now his home. Um, and those, those two visual references, it provided the inspiration to come up with um, the Quia Basket um, series. So next slide. 
I wanted to show you a picture. This is um, his father, uh, Gerald Clark Sr. on horseback in his role as a cowboy. Um, Gerald mentioned that role of, of um, the ranch, the Clark Ranch that they operate. And he has great respect for his father um, and also the importance of family. And we're gonna see this in, as we um, talk about other artworks, you're gonna see that relationship um, to his family. So um, the last slide, please. And so I'm also showing um, a piece from the Monument series. And the reason I'm, I'm showing this is because this is essentially a portrait of his father and his three aunts. Um, the title of this is To the Previous Generation from 1997. So here he's paying tribute um, to, to his father and his three aunts. Uh, essentially, he selected their favorite drinking beverage and then selected colors that he thought um, represented each of each of his three aunts. And then of course the beer mug represents his father. Um, so this is how, um, you know, he incorporates all these um, found objects. And, and in this case, he's elevating and celebrating something, a very everyday activity. He might just sit down at the kitchen table um, to have a cup of coffee or, or tea or a beer. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say, I think one of the things I learned so much about Gerald's work is that his art and his life are completely inseparable. <laughs> um, he celebrates uh, life experiences, uh, both combining past and present, uh, or the joyous and the tragic. His creative acts are visual artistic expressions of sovereignty and by expressing his freedom of self-determination he has discovered, and I wanted to end a quote with him, that the more personal I make my work, the more universal it becomes. So thank you. Thank you so much, Christine, for talking about um, Gerald's work and, and the inspiration point in relation to our collection. Um, I really appreciate hearing uh, some of these stories and, and how this uh, great commission came about. And now, Ashley, I would uh, love to turn it over to you. Um, and your uh, connection point comes with Gerald from a different perspective. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And uh, thank you so much for participating with us. We know that you're in a different time zone and a different <laughs> temperature. Um, so thank you so much for coming to our museum virtually. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Thank you, Christine, for that wonderful overview. And especially thank you, Gerald, for your, your incredible art and for trusting me to um, write about it, which is such a, an honor and um, also a responsibility. And so when I started thinking about what I wanted to say about Gerald's art, you know, I kept coming back to his use of language and was really thinking about you know, that nursery rhyme of sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. And when you think about that from a native perspective, that's not true. Words and language have been used against native people for hundreds of years as a way to, um, you know, enact genocide and the use of um, language. If you look at the um, Declaration of Independence, the way that native people are referred to there is merciless Indian savages. If you think about treaties, that treaties are written documents that take away land, that reduce cultural sovereignty. And so it didn't seem surprising to me that Gerald was gravitating towards language in a way that really was reclaiming it. And I have here selected um, two additional works from the, the Monument series. And the one on the left is Indian Wisdom, which is just such a wonderful interactive piece that you, you put a quarter in and the idea is that you were going to receive some Indian wisdom from a very, I, I think, very smart, um, intelligent looking character, which of course is um, a portrait of Gerald. And what you actually get is that you do get Indian wisdom, but it's the written word of native authors. And oftentimes those, um, those words are not what people would expect. They are not that stereotypical 
um, new age sort of concept of Indian wisdom, but really thoughtful written documentation of how strong and resilient and thoughtful native people are and continue to be and have been from the very beginning, even as language was being used against them. And the, the piece is so wonderful because it includes this um, small version of a statue that's called End of the Trail, which right there you think about how telling a title like that is for a piece that basically is situated in California, that this idea that Native people have been pushed so far through what is now known as the United States, that there's nowhere else for us and that we cease to exist. But rather than including the spear, it takes a pencil and it's saying, you know, okay, this is a false narrative, this end of the trail, it's not over. Native people are continuing, there's continuing to be resilient and they're taking back their own um, representation oftentimes through the use of language. And then with Manifest Destiny, which is on the right, um, you know, the idea that you can use a quarter and get a dollar in return, which is very much tied into the idea of Manifest Destiny, which was this 19th century idea. And I, I have to say, I, I think it still continues today that this land was basically here for European um, Europeans to take, that it was destined to happen. It was willed by God and therefore there was nothing wrong with it. And it's tied to that idea of getting something for nothing, that the land was just here to take, even though it already was um, not belonging to somebody else, but it was already somebody's home. And it continues to be native people's home, even if that is not always acknowledged by the dominant society. Next slide. And then these wonderful moments where Gerald has now moved from branding paper to actually branding books. And you know, this, this book particularly stuck out to me because it's by an author named JJ Brody, who was writing, um, you know, this book was done in the 70s and he was still writing scholarship and is still thought of as a, a really profound scholar of American art as is associated to like the Indian painters of the turn of the 20th century into the 1930s and 40s. And how Brody, who is a white man, is the sort of original scholar of native art, even though the native people were oftentimes left out of the narratives about their art. They talked about them in terms of who their patrons were who um, who was buying the art, who was helping shape what that artwork looked like. And so native people within these sorts of texts become secondary characters in our own story about art production. And that's something that continues even today that so little um, scholarship is produced about native art. And it's really unfortunate because people oftentimes don't realize that the way that university programs teach about art is through literature. And that if there isn't literature about native art, then there's nothing to teach in essence, even though we all know that's not true. Um, and so, you know, Gerald is reclaiming in some way um, that narrative and really being very straightforward that it, it's about money and it's about prominence and it's about dominance. Next slide. And then this is a work that I think um, really depicts that concept of continuum in a very physical way that task came out of a dream that Gerald had after 9-11. And it was um, a way in that he saw a crumpled sheet that's thin iron that reveals all of these words that relate to religion across the world. And as the sheet is iron, it moves through um, sort of a structure that then pulls it back through books that recrumple it. And it's a continuous cycle that's never ending. And how, you know, there's, there's so much responsibility in this work as Gerald performs it of continuously doing the action of ironing the words out and having them reveal, but it, it continuously recrumpling. And I, I think that that is very um, emblematic of 
Gerald's process and his work. I don't think that he ever feels sort of that he's done exploring all of these themes, whether it be language or humor or, you know, exposing sort of the, the dark underbelly of the United States culture as it relates to Native people. And that burden is what keeps him creating artwork and why I am just, you know, always so excited when he creates something new because it, it's a continuation of his earlier practices and it's also um, the idea that he's never done in his expression. Next slide. There are a couple of, I think, more image shots here where you can see the words and very much the, um, the way that when you think about religion, how language is used in religion and religious text. Next slide. Next slide. And here you have Gerald performing it. Um, I met Gerald in 2007 when he was a fellow at the Idol Jorg and he actually performed this work on site and it was filmed and it was really just incredible to watch the physical demand that went into creating it as well as the way that people would interact with him because they would recognize words on there and whether you know they understood that he was um, an artist from you know, the Kawea band or that he was thinking about different concepts of sort of indigenous identity or even just contemporary life, there was a connection that people could see through the words that he was using. And that was a really powerful realization for this work. Next slide. Oh, now I will, <laughs> the end. <laughs> thank you. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for talking about that. And it again is a perfect segue because your an assessment of Gerald's use of language is um, so uh, interesting and something you write about in the book, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, this is a segue into what Gerald's going to talk about. So I know he's going to address this painting, but again, um, I believe one of the first that he, times that he used language. Um, and so hopefully later we'll be able to have a discussion about where some of these pieces overlap and interweave. So thank you so much, Ashley, for um, <coughs> putting forward this idea of language and identity. So Gerald, um, I, I know that you've um, brought a, a few more pictures to show us. Um, and so we'd love to hear from you about some other aspects of the exhibition before we have a little bit of a discussion. Sure, yeah. So uh, I have to say, and, and people might be surprised to hear this, but I wasn't even conscious of how extensively I use text and language in my work. I'm, you know, I'm just busy working and, and uh, you know, I learned from seeing the show myself, seeing all this work together, I learned something about myself and in reading Ashley's essay, she pointed it out that, wow, it, it really is, you know, throughout the work. So I got to thinking about it. And this is one of the first pieces I, where I purposefully use language. And this is one of the first paintings I did out of graduate school. And um, I, I got tired of people when they found out I had an art degree. I got tired of people telling me that I should make Native American art. And you know what they were, we all know what they were talking about, right? Which is stuff that might sell in Santa Fe or, or Scottsdale or what have you. And so I, I got angry and so I glued, I got this American flag printed cloth and I glued it to the canvas, sealed it up. And then I, I, I replaced some of the flags with uh, dollar bills. And then I just wrote, so there was no confusion. I wrote Native American art right on the, the surface of the, the work. So. You know, just kind of out of anger that I did that, but it was really a conscious uh, decision to include text, which I hadn't really done before this painting. Uh, next slide, please. You see the little small white thing at the bottom of the painting. And that's again, um, it's a found object. It was a, a pair of hands that were like praying hands, like from a craft store. And I asked if I could only buy one and they said, no, you gotta buy the pair. So I, I took one and I fashioned it and I actually, it bolts to the front of the painting. And it's no accident, it's a white hand. You know, the Native American art market is mostly run by non-Natives. And one of the things I really like about this painting is every time I show it, uh, someone will leave a little bit of change in the white hand. <laughs> and so I, I like that idea, you know, because I think that, that shows me that, yeah, they kind of get it, you know. Next slide, please. 
And so here's the, the, this slide and the next one is, you know, uh, again, going back to this idea of who belongs in America and who, who's native and who's an immigrant. And I think it was important uh, for a native person to actually, you know, get involved with the conversation. And so it works its way into my art. You know, I'm influenced by a lot of things. Next slide, please. And I watch the news. I, I listen to, you know, uh, podcasts and stuff. And so just using that paper and, and you know, I showed you the, the image of where I'm making it. And it it's kind of a violent act of, of burning this paper. And I'm not, I'm not a violent person. I abhor violence, but that's part of our times, it would seem, uh, especially, you know, this past year or so. So that, the heat, you know, the scarring of the paper, I'm, I'm really destroying the paper. But in a lot of ways, for me, that's, that's kind of, you know, it represents what's going on in America today. Next slide. The, the self-portrait here, this is a, a, from a, a residency I did in Vermont back in 2017. And everything you see there is text. So uh, I bought a rubber stamp and I with little letters, rubber letters that I put into the stamp. And it was my way of doing a drawing. You, you stamp the stamp on the ink and then on the paper and it's dark. And if you keep doing it, it gets lighter and that's a value scale. So this is one I did uh, uh, in 2017. But the first one, uh, go to the next slide, was actually done towards the end of graduate school. I had, a, I, I had a lot more optimism in my eyes and a lot more hair on my head, it looks like, at that time. But uh, and in this one, I actually, that's my name, my Bureau of Indian Affairs roll number, my degree of Indian blood, all kind of stamped into my image. But for me, I, I almost see those kind of as drawing and, and it's, all, it's all text. Uh, move forward. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, James Luna had his artifact piece, and so I wanted to make an artifact piece. So this is kind of homage, similar to the mug piece that Christine presented, of just a portraits of my dad and my three aunts, and, you know, I, I love them all deeply. And so I actually took a Sharpie, and I just wrote stories uh, about my memories of each of them, and, you know, uh, just wrote on the handles of them. I welded our cattle brand uh, symbols on the spade part of the shovels. So I used the shovel kind of, you know, to symbolize that I come from like a working class background, but also these stories in a way I'm kind of digging up the past, you know? And so those, those choices I make in the studio, there, there's always a reason why I choose a material or, uh, you know, a, a medium. Uh, and then one more, you know, I talk a lot about the importance of local, and so I wanted to end with this piece. This is called The Peon Players, and this is um, uh, referencing a traditional gambling game that uh, many of the, the Indian people here in Southern California, and again, over in Arizona and, and uh, Nevada play. And, you know, one of the things that's very interesting to me about this piece is that um, if you're from within my culture and you look at it, you, you know immediately what it is, and it's, it might as well be like a bowl of fruit or something, you know. But if you're outside of the culture, it, all of a sudden it takes on this kind of surrealist, kind of otherworldly, kind of fairy tale fantasy kind of uh, experience. And so that's interesting. That's what this piece is, is about. But it's also about engaging my community. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful, so grateful to be showing there in Palm Springs because that's Kahlia land. And you know, one of the hardest things for a native artist is to show your work where your own people can experience it. And you know, there's not a lot of contemporary art spaces on native, uh, you know, American Indian reservations. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for having the show there. And, and you know, so that, the, and I was really uh, pleased at the opening that we had so many Indian people there, you know, cause that's a public space. That, and it, I think it enhanced everyone's experience. By, by, by being that way. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you so much for um, taking us through more of the exhibition. And thank you so much for this very thoughtful and thought provoking exhibition that we were able to see between January and March. And when we do reopen, we will have your exhibition continue on view. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to note, this is the completed um, publication. And we're all so happy to have it. We all have it here. Um, and it is available um, in our online shop. So you can order it. Um, all uh, three of these fantastic speakers have contributed 
text and all of these images that you've seen and many, many, many more are included in the book. Um, it also includes an interview with Gerald um, and um, there are descriptions and written uh, analysis of each of these pieces. So it is very rich in its content, both um, visually and textually. So we hope you will um, check into uh, getting the book from uh, the Palm Springs Art Museum website. So um, for those of you who are interested in asking questions, please go ahead and um, put them in the question section. But in the meantime, while you're doing that, I would like to just um, suggest that uh, we have a little bit of a discussion. When we were talking this week, some pieces, some points came up um, as we were exploring some of these pieces. So I just wanted to start um, first with this idea of history and continuum, the past, the present and future. And one thing, Gerald, that um, we've heard a number of times from you and you've mentioned today is this um, idea that time isn't necessarily linear, um, that there is um, a respect for um, how these different aspects and eras tie together. So can we talk a little bit about this uh, continuum and time? Well, one of, one of the texts I use in uh, one of my uh, California Indian history classes by uh, Dr. William Bauer, uh, he, he, he does a, a good job of pointing out that, you know, for, for history, for, for a lot of Native people, it's not based on a date or a time, it's based on a place. And when I read that and then I apply that to what I know of our own Kauia beliefs, and it's all about place. There, there are sacred sites, and with each of those sites is a story. And the story never really kind of focuses on when it happened. It focuses on what happened and where it happened. And so, you know, that I think that impacts me a bit in in how I, I view view time as being, you know, um, the basketry. So the, the basket behind you right there, you know, the um, you know, there's a long history of, of basketry. And in my family, it was mostly women who did it. So I respect that, that gender difference, but I wanted to pay homage, right, to that tradition. And I did so in my own way. And um, I have a Hopi friend who's a glass blower, and he, you know, they ask him about the, you know, the history of uh, Hopi glass blowing. He says, I'm it, right? <laughs> but it's starting something new too, right? And the, I often ask my students, like, how long do you have to do something before it's traditional? And it may be once, it may be twice or what have you, but, you know, I, I try to think in that linear way, you know, I, I think of it like a, a cyclical kind of way. So Ashley, can I ask you um, at, with your uh, Cherokee background, is that sure. resonates um, in terms of this question of time and place and is there a similarity or a difference? Oh, absolutely. And it, it's something that I think a lot about is that this idea of like authentic and authentic Native art that um, somehow what we're creating today is not as authentic as what was created in the past and that they're actually all just a part of the same story, this continuing story that's always reinventing itself, that art forms are always reinventing themselves and that you know, production is is a part of who we are as Native people and that in the future, it's gonna look different than it looks now and that everything is tied together and is not linear by any means. Thank you so much. And Christine, you've been um, looking at the Native material and particularly the historic material. So um, do you have a thought about this idea of continuation of time? Um, well, I think, you know, one of the things I actually learned from Gerald about this was, you know, we, we this collection um, dates back to the uh, early part of the 20th century, the, our basket collection I'm speaking of, and, um, and it has been preserved. And as far as I know, it was collected fairly. There's, there's no evidence of anything collected unfair, but, you know, it is a very difficult time for native cultures. It's a time when they're losing their culture. They've lost a lot of their land and suffered um, genocide. So I want to put in that context. But we had several um, people in Palm Springs came in the uh, first decades of the um, 1900s who collected from the local Native Americans. And also it was a, a place for them to kind of escape. And ironically, it was 
there they were named there's three white sisters um and one was a doctor um florella and she had a partnership with um, another uh, with a woman, Marjorie Rose Dugan. And so I think Palm Springs also provided that sort of a place to do that um, and, you know, um, have that sort of relationship. And then there's um, Isabel who married a author, a uh, natural um, history author from, from Britain and Cornelia who helped found the museum. And one of the things Cornelia did was uh, Marjorie uh, collected a tremendous amount of um, about 35 baskets What's unique about our collection um, that Cornell purchased it to give to the museum is that, you know, most of the Native American art you see is often anonymous. Basket makers, uh, Navajo weavers, they're anonymous, but she collect, she purposely collected work from local Kuya and the names have come down. So we have, you know, a great resource in, in, that, um, in that collection. And the one you saw with the bats, uh, Donna Torte work that um, Gerald used in, that's what one from, that's a good example of that collection. So, so it's, it's a rich collection. So I'm glad we have it. And one of the things Gerald said is it was preserved. And then that way, you know, a lot of this information that was lost has, has been preserved so they can look and, and regenerate and reuse, um, you know, some of these, some of these items in today. So so um, that actually um, leads into something that Ashley, I hope you'll help us address, um, which has to do with the, the challenges of collecting Native American material. Um, you have worked in the Idle Jorg Museum, which has a particular um, context and a particular lens, um, and now are in uh, a different kind of institution, which is focus differently in terms of um, not only collecting, but also commissioning. Mm -hmm. But can you um, help us with the issues that face museums today and the work that you're doing to help guide some of these questions, which have to do with um, certain issues of colonialism and inclusion and exclusion, um, because these are so important and relevant today and always. Yeah, you know, I always I always remind people that museums in and of themselves are colonial tools, that museums were really meant to display the 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 rewards of colonial um, overtaking of people and places. And, you know, those legacies are not gone. They are ongoing realities. And a lot of museums have um, historical collections of Native art that are directly because of that sort of reality. And what has been so interesting is that I think museums are starting to acknowledge that these collections are sometimes problematic, that even if they were collected in a very um, what you might say ethical way and that they were purchased from native people, that the reality of native people at the time that they were creating this artwork was one of genocide and trauma and that they were being collected under duress or they were collecting um, materials because they thought that native people were disappearing and they wanted to you know, have a relic of them or to even own native bodies and do that both through the actual owning of native bodies, but also through um, in some ways using the art as a, a replacement for the native body and to show that, you know, manifest destiny was being carried out and it was being successful. And so I think what is wonderful with this show is that in some ways we are we are taking um, Christine, you know, bringing those objects and having Gerald create a new work of art from an object that is sat in a museum away from its community, even if it's still, you know, situated on the community and available, but giving it sort of a, a new life and giving it a continuation that is tied to the contemporary going forward. And museums, I think, will really benefit if they start thinking about their collections in that way and viewing contemporary Native people as fully connected to past Native peoples and that the art forms are connected and are not separate and that you can really start talking about them in terms of American art that doesn't force them to fall within concepts of American art that's not 
a space that was, you know, really created for Native people's art production. And so that that's something that I'm always thinking about. And, you know, I don't have the full answer yet. I don't think anybody does. But I think that museums that are really thinking about it are um, are on the right track, at least. Cheryl, do you um, have something you might want to add, especially because you're a professor and you're teaching another generation that is so influenced not only by your work, but also by your perspective? Well, I, I can say that most of my students will, will probably agree with this, that they leave my class with more questions than answers. <laughs> and I think that's a very indigenous way of approaching a subject. And Ashley's right. What's going on right now with, with museums, with um, you know, indigenizing spaces or what have you, all that's in flux right now. There's a a conference at the end of the month about writing about like, how do we write about Native American art, right? So it's all very much, you know, uh, on people's minds these days. And, you know, for, for me, I, I, I'm i glad uh, uh, Christine brought up uh, genocide. Uh, you know, when I'm, I, I, when I'm making my art, that, that's a, that, to me, I'm making a, a, a statement of creative sovereignty. You know, this is who I am. And I'm not gonna make someone else's idea of Native American art. Uh, and I've gone through that process. I used to think of myself as just an artist who happened to be Native. I thought of myself as a Native American artist. And these days I've, I've just embraced the idea. I'm a Kahuya man and I, I make art. And that's, that's who I am. And, and that's, my, that's my, you know, I, I see a question in the, the, the text there, the, the chat about, you know, like uh, Native artists being pigeonholed. Right. And yeah, I think that's a reality of it. And so, you know, but I'm going to continue to do what I do. And I think the more honest you make, like, like uh, the, the quote, Christine, that the more honest you are in your own work, uh, the more universal it becomes. And that's how I combat those kinds of, of, of you know, kind of pigeonholing or categorization of, of who I am and, as an artist. So I see there's some questions lining up here. So I want to address the first one, which was actually something I wanted to close this section with, and then Yesenia will field questions for us for you to answer. But um, I wanted to just mention um, that we have at the entry of our museum and also at the entry of this exhibition, a land acknowledgement. And it's also at the start of the book. And I would like to read that for a moment, um, just to frame um, some thinking from the Palm Springs Art Museum at this moment. And it's not to say that this land acknowledgement might not change in its text, but it is the one that we developed uh, uh, about a year ago when this exhibition was opening and as this book went to press with consultation and advice and help from um, the uh, Gerald's tribe and also from Agua Caliente tribe um, so that we had some input. Um, and it reads, every community in the United States owes its existence and vitality to people from around the world. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn here in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Recognition of the many layers of our history is critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers and heritage and difference. Palm Springs Art Museum res respectfully acknowledges the ancestral homelands of the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians and other sovereign Indian nations of Southern California. We recognize their ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this land, past, present, and future. And so this is um, our land acknowledgement today. Um, and we hope it will evolve as we come to understand and um, be guided. Um, we have been guided so much by Gerald and by others um, <laughs> with gratitude. So thank you so much, Gerald. Um, and everybody who has been part of this exhibition and part of, a, part of getting us to where we are today. Um, I would like to ask Yesenia to please help us with the questions um, and we will take it from there. So if you have questions, please let us um, know by writing them in and um, we'll move through them. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Gerald, Ashley, and Christine for this wonderful talk. Um, our first question is actually to Gerald regarding the artifacts work. 
the question asks, the top of the shovels all have different colors that look like colored tape. What do the co colors represent on each of these top shovels? Yeah, that's uh, some, uh, some good eyes there. Uh, yeah, that's colored ribbon around those, those uh, handles. And um, those, there are a variety of uh, written accounts of our creation story. And at that time, the one I had uh, that I was uh, reading, um, it, th those are the four, first four colors that were listed uh, in our creation story that appeared in creation. And so I used those uh, at, on the handles of the, uh, <laughs> of the shovels. And actually, those same colors appeared on those mugs. If you notice, there was a brown mug, a yellow mug, a green mug, and then the the, the actual uh, tablecloth had red. So the, uh, they're, they're, they're there, but th thank you for asking that because, yeah, that was on purpose. Thank you so much. Uh, another question actually engages with what you mentioned before, Gerald, which is your use of words in your works more often. They ask, as an English-only user, I feel your ideals are done so well in English, so poetically and symbolically connected. Does it have the same sense for the native speaker and their language? Another, another good question. Actually, the newer signs, if you go through the parks there, the public parks in Palm Springs, the newer signs, I've abandoned English altogether. And so there's only an image and then the Kalia word. And to be honest with you, even people who don't speak the Kalia language, I think they could they could look at the word, the queer word, and then look at the picture, and I think they could understand what it says. So that's something I, I think, um, you know, that I, I've, I, I'm moving towards, and, and I'll be doing more of. But um, you know, I, I, our language is an endangered language, and there is a, a preservation effort going on, and um, it's not re revitalization. It's always been vital to us. And we're just reclaiming it now. And, and uh, there's, there's a lot of programs on our reservations and in our communities for, for our youth to, to get involved with that. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's part of why I, I, I did those signs. The original imp impetus was to kind of get our language back out there. Thank you. Our next question comes from Peg, who is asking about the coiled basket piece. Is it actually quilled with warp and weft? And if so, how was that done? Or was it the aluminum affixed to the piece? So pe Peg must be a, must be a weaver. Uh, no, it's not done that way. Uh, you know, the story that Christine was telling, you know, um, my dad was a drinker and, and him and his buddies, they would crush these cans and then throw them, you know, to take them to the recycler. And I was looking at one can and it, it just reminded me of a coil, like in our coil basketry. And so those are epoxied onto the surface of the, um, of the, the uh, satellite dish, which has that kind of tray shape. And, but like a, a, um, a, a basket weaver, traditionally, I start in the center and I just start going around and planning out my design and going round and round. And actually that was, that whole work was done flat because it's, it's quite large when you're working on it. And so I actually didn't get to see the work, the finished work until we installed it at the museum. And I asked Christine for permission to kind of make some alterations or changes uh, if it wasn't quite right, but we hung it on the wall and we got back and there it was, I, I didn't have to change anything. So it was really, uh, <laughs> really a great moment. Thank you, Gerald. I think we have one more question and time for one more before we break. Our last question is, what influenced and motivated you into becoming an artist and taking the next steps into incorporating more contemporary style into your art rather than traditional native art? You know, um... When, when, when we when we talk to artists and, and a lot of times we ask them like what their influences are and uh, a lot of times we end up uh, you know saying what artists uh, you know are heroes or what have you but, you know my big heroes were my dad and the hard-working uh, Indians and cowboys that, that were in those generations before me but you know actually poverty <laughs> Poverty has been a huge influence on my work. And I love paintings. I love looking at paintings. I like those juicy, thick paintings, but I don't do them. 
uh, I grew up so poor that I always paint. When I do paint, I just finished a painting this past week. I paint real thin. And I think it's just that, you know, I still look to save three or three cents a gallon when I fill up my truck. You know, it's just like the poverty is just in me, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I was lucky, I think, that in being poor, that we had to make our own entertainment, our own amusement. And so we were always building things and, you know, I couldn't, my parents couldn't afford the, the, the costume from Party City for Halloween and we were just left to our own devices. And, and so I think, you know, and, and then also why, why I'm doing what I do instead of traditional native art. Well, I'm doing traditional native art. I'm, I'm going out, I'm gathering materials from my environment and I'm combining them to make something that's uh, maybe uh, beautiful or aesthetic uh, that's meaningful and useful for my community. That's kind of how I see what I do. I think it's just like a, a traditional basket uh, weaver. I'm doing the same thing. But again, it's, it's, I understand it's not what people expect, but this is, this is an expression of, of my creative sovereignty as a contemporary Native person. Thank you so much. Um, I know that there's somebody who's written in to express their incredible gratitude to you, Gerald, and to everybody here. And I would like to echo that so much. I would like to thank you all for your thoughts and your wisdom and um, for being here with us tonight. Um, and also for your incredible contributions to this book. We're so proud to have published your first monograph. Um, and we hope that uh, it is something that will influence many, many students and um, many, many enthusiasts and generations to come. And we'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. And I'd like to thank the team that has helped to put this together because there are a lot of people behind the scenes. Um, Isenia, thank you so much, Colin and Sheridan and everybody who's been a part of putting this together. Thank you very, very much for um, all the hard work to make this live tonight. So um, good night, everybody. This link will be um, available for a week um, on our website and possibly into the future. And we, our next program will be on the 25th and it will be a, a virtual tour of our glass exhibition. There'll be information about that on our website um, later this week and into the next week. So thank you so much and good night. <laughs>